but probably the best is that you're all going to be very good at passing around pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this session, uh, I have to be honest, to start, is, is, is a shear. If you think you're in the wrong session, now's the time to go, we won't notice too much. Um, I can say at the beginning and I can say at the end, we can give this over to our students, but it's not really an exercise in teaching a group of children, it's more sharing an idea together, which hopefully we can learn from and we can learn the mechanics of and we can learn the pedagogy of as well. But I won't be explicitly saying it every day, and you can say to the students, thus, I'll leave that to you to sort of take away. We are the people of the covenant. We are the people who live a covenantal existence. That is the basis of the Jewish religion, and it's the basis of Jewish history. And many of our great thinkers, from Rabbi Soloveitchik to Rabbi Sachs, talk repeatedly about how we are the people of the covenant. And that defines so much of who we are and what we do. The question is, what is the covenant? What exactly is the nature of this covenant? It's something between us and God, and it's something to do with what happened at Har Sinai, and it's something to do with the Torah, but what is the nature of this covenant? Now, the way to answer such a question is to look in the sources. And that's what we're going to do. I think still some more people come in. And that's what we're going to do. Because we actually have, in the Fumash, a description, quite detailed description, of the making of that covenant. And if we look at the psukim that describe the making of that covenant, and in particular, then see the some Forshim and some Midrashim on one particular aspect thereof, we can get an idea of how to answer the question, what is the nature of the covenant? The description of the giving of the Torah is described in Shemot Perak Yotet. The Aserah the Divra of the Ten Commandments come in Shemot Perak Kaf. The description of what happens exactly in Perak Yotet is complicated and convoluted. And to be honest, it's rarely taught, probably for those two reasons. Moshe goes up a mountain, down a mountain, he gives messages to the people. The people say, we want to hear from you, we want to hear from God. And then he gives them the Aserah the Divra of God gives them the Aserah the Divra. That's another confusion. One of the problems with this particular parasha, with this particular story, is it's in the wrong place. The story of the making of the covenant comes four parakim later in Perakaf Dalit. And to be honest, we rarely get there. It's right at the end of the Sedra of Mishpatim. Mishpatim is long and has lots and lots of mitzvot. And whether we teach it or whether we learn it, we spend a long time learning some of those mitzvot. And we often don't get to the end of the Sedra of Mishpatim which is unfortunate, because it's the story of the making of the covenant. And if we look at quote number one, Rashi, at the very beginning of Perak Kaftalat, says, Parasha zu ne'emra kodem aseret ha'dibrot. This parasha was said before the aseret ha'dibrot. Rashi's got a thing about many of the sections in Sefer Shemot are in the wrong order. In fact, he, he rearranges the whole of the second half of Sefer Shemot in quite a critical and interesting way, that's not our subject now. The point is, when we come to Perakaf Dalot, we should bear in mind that what we're about to read actually preceded the giving of the Torah, even though it's written afterwards. And what do we find? So let's just see a few psukim from Perakaf Dalot. And it says like this in quote number two. V'yavo Moshe v'yasapir la'am et kol divrei Hashem ve'et kol ha'mishpatim. Moshe came and said to the people all the words of Hashem, and all the mishpatim, what the mishpatim are, well, that's for another time as well. The yan kol am kol echad, and all the people answered with one voice. There's a bit more table area over here. I think we're out of chairs. There's a bit more table area there. Floor, ceiling. The yan kol am. We're in quote number two. So there are sheets. I don't know if they're still going round. There are sheets somewhere, but I can't get one on the side. But we're in quote number two in the first pasuk, in the middle of the pasuk. In fact, maybe I'll start again from the beginning of the pasuk. V'yavo Moshe v'yasa v'yala amit kol divrei Hashem v'et kol mishpatim. Moshe came and he said to the people all the words of Hashem and all the mishpatim, all the Lord. V'yan kol ha'am, kol echad. And the people all answered with one voice. V'yomru kol ha'am, kol ha'am, kol ha'am, kol ha'am, kol ha'am, kol ha'am, all that Hashem has said, we will do. So we're up for it. We're happy to go along with what you're proposing. 
Vayichtov Moshe et kol divrei Hashem. Moshe wrote all the words of Hashem. Now remember that. There aren't a lot of books in the Qumash, which is funny because we're the people of the book and it's the book. But there aren't all that many books referred to in the book. But this is one. Moshe wrote all the words of Hashem. Vayashkem baboke, and he got up in the morning. Vayiven mizbeach tachat ahar, and he built an altar under the mountain. Ushtem Yisrael matzeva, and ushtem matzeva and there were 12 uh, pseudo altars um, with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes. Yishlach is now a rey b'nei Yisrael, and he sent the youngsters of the b'nei Yisrael, the Yalu Olot, and they offered burnt offerings, the Yisbechuz Vachim, Shlamim Hashem Parim. They offered sacrifices, peace offerings for Hashem, which were bulls. Uh, there's lots of sacrifices, even where we don't expect them. There's lots of sacrifices going on in the Chumash. And this ceremony, which involved this making of the covenant, involved sacrifices. And in a minute you'll see what the sacrifices provided in the very next verse. V'yikach Moshe chatzi adam v'yasem ba'agonot v'chatzi adam zarak al mizbeach. Moshe took half the blood that came from the animals and he put it in bowls and half the blood he put it on the mizbeach. <coughs> so as part of the ritual of making this covenant, it's, there's blood, sounds a little bit primitive, but we're not going to get into that now. But he puts half the blood in the bowls, which he's later on going to sprinkle in the direction of the people, and half the blood on the altar, symbolizing a unity, a coming together between God and the people. And here's the key verse. This is what we've been building up to. Pasuk Zayin. Vayikach Sefer Habrit. Vayikra Ba'aznei Ha'am. He took what we're now calling, for the first time, Sefer Habrit, the book of the covenant, and he read it in the ears of the people. Vayomru, and they said, Ko asher diber Hashem naser v'nishma. The words that are familiar, the words that we teach the children in kindergarten, this is actually the source. Here it is, it's written after Matan Torah, but according to Rashi, it refers to something that happened before. Moshe reads the Sefer Habrit. And when they hear the Sefer Habrit, they say, Naaseh v'nishma. We will do, and we will listen, or hear, or understand, and in that order, and they're praised for saying, we'll do, even before we fully understand. The understanding might have to come later. But on the words that Moshe reads to them, which are the words of the Sefer Habrit, that's what they say yes to. Then Moshe took the other half of the blood, the Yisrok and Ha'am, and he sprinkled it towards the people. And he said, Here is the blood of the covenant on which Hashem has made with you on all these things. What's the question? What's the key question that we need to understand in order to understand what makes us Jewish? What was written in the Sefer Habrit? Now, let's understand why it's a question and why it's such an important question. It's a question because we haven't a clue. Okay? Now, we have a reference to Moshe writing something in Pasuk Dalet. And there it says he wrote, Kol Divrei Hashem. It's a reasonable assumption that what he wrote in Pasuk Dalet is what he then read in Pasuk Zion. Although it's not explicit. It doesn't say exactly the same thing, but it's a reasonable assumption. But we're not really sure what he wrote. He wrote, Kol Divrei Hashem. Now, Hashem's had a lot to say. In, since the beginning of creation. So what words of Hashem in particular is Moshe writing down? Or what are the mishpatim that go with it? By the way, if we don't adopt Rashi's ordering of the parashiyot, then we can answer that question more easily. Because if Hosef Perak comes in the right place, after all the mishpatim, after all the additional laws, mostly Ben Adam Lachavero, have been given following the Aseret Dibrat, then it would make sense that Kala Mishpatim refers to all those Mishpatim. According to Rashi, that won't work, because according to Rashi, this parasha, as we said at the beginning, and this is the, the view of Chazal, and I think this makes a lot of sense, was took place before Matan Torah, and therefore the Mishpatim have to be something else. But nevertheless, we come to Pasuk Zion, and it's quite clear that when the Jews said these fantastic words, Naaseh and Nishma, and they said, yes, we want to be bound up with Hashem, they said it in response to what was written in Sefer Habrit. So in order to know what exactly they agreed to, and hence, what is the covenant, and hence, what is the Jewish people, we want to know what is in Sefer Habrit. So fortunately, we have the Maforashim, and we have the Midrashim. So let's start with seeing what Rashi says. So Rashi says, on Pasuk Gimel, the first time Moshe writes something down, he says, Et kol divrei Hashem. 
mitzvot, prisha, v'hagbala. The mitzvah of separating and the making a boundary. There was a lot of references in the preparation for Matam Torah about how the Jews have to keep away from the mountain. And that's the prisha, that's the separation, and the hagbala is the making of the boundary thus far and no further, but then allowed to cross. You know, before Shavuot, we send all our kinder kids home with pictures of Matam Torah with Harsinai with a little picket fence around the bottom of it. It, it wasn't a picket fence, it was just a, a halachic boundary that you can't cross, but you can't draw that so well, so, you know, the fence is good. Anyway, then, the next phrase that Moshe wrote in Pasuk Gimel is Kala Mishpatim, and as I said, Rashi can't explain that as referring to what we generally call the Mishpatim, because according to Rashi, it was happened before the Mishpatim were given. So what are the Mishpatim? And the answer is, Zayin Mitzvah Shinitztavu B'nei Noach, the seven Noachide laws, the Shabbat, the Kibbut of the Aim, Upara Aduma, the Dinim, Shinit Nulahem Bamara, and a little collection of laws. According to Rashi, based on Chazal, when the Jews came to Mara, immediately after Kriyat Yamsuf, they came to a place called Mara, the water was bitter, and they uh, couldn't drink the water, and uh, Hashem told Moshe to throw a tree into the water, and it became sweet, and they could drink it, and there Hashem gave them a few mitzvot. And Rashi explains that they were sort of Reader's Digest introductory package to the mitzvot. They weren't all 613, they were just a few to get you going. And it's interesting, and this is a fascinating uh, lesson in itself, why those few were selected. Why, how, in what way do they represent the totality of mitzvot? And they were, although there are different versions and even possibly different texts of Rashi, but what we have here is Shabbat, Kibbut Abba'im, on parents, Para Uduma, the red heifer, which defies explanation, and dinim, and setting up some sort of basic interpersonal civil laws. And they were given to them at Marat. So Rashi says, you're right, we haven't got, at this point in, in history, they haven't got the whole Torah, but they've got some laws. They've got the laws of preparing for Matan Torah. They've got the Noahide laws, the Bathsheba Mitzvah and Noah, which everyone's had since the time of the flood. And they've got a few more that they've been given just as a sort of taster. So those are the ones that they could be preferring to. Now then, Rashi says Sefer Habrit is actually something different. When it comes to Sefer Habrit, quote number four, Rashi says, Sefer Habrit is Mi Bereshit Va'ad Matan Torah U Mitzvah Chinitzavu Bamara From Bereshit until Matan Torah and those few extra mitzvot. What does he mean from Bereshit until Matan Torah? There is a dispute in the Gemara about whether the entire Torah was written in one go at the very end of Moshe's life, or whether he wrote it sort of in serial form as the events happened. And that, that's left unresolved. But what is clear is that at some stage, he wrote everything that had happened up till now, from Bereshit until this point. In other words, says Rashi, Sefer Habrit is the first quarter of the Chumash. It's from the beginning, until you get to Matan Torah. And what does that mean? That means the creation of the world. That means the flood. It means Avram, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Yosef, his brothers, the descent into Mitzrayim, into Egypt, the exodus, sorry, the slavery, and the exodus. It's a book of history. The Sefer Habrit, according to Rashi, is a book of history. Up to where we've come to. And then a few mitzvot thrown in. <coughs> and the people say, Na seven Nishma. What does that mean? What are they saying, Na seven Nishma? <coughs> if Moshe has just read to them the first quarter of the Chumash, he's read to them the story of Bereshit, he's read to them the story of the flood, he's read to them the story of the Avot, and the people say, Na seven Nishma, what that means is they are saying, We want that history to be our history. We want to share in the history of the Jewish people. We want to connect to what's gone before, and that constitutes the covenant. That constitutes what links us with God, and also what links us with each other. We are signing up to Jewish history. That's what makes us Jewish. That we are the inheritors of a legacy that came from our ancestors, and the experiences including the slavery and the redemption that we as a people have been through, that's what we are now signing up to. That's what we're saying, yes, Naseva Nishma to. 
If we turn over the page, the Ibn Ezra says, <coughs> on Pasuk Gimel, what was it that Moshe recited to the people when he wrote something, and he said something, and he wrote something, on the words, V'yasapeh la ha'am et kol divrei Hashem, mitzvot aseh, v'lo ta'aseh, shehem ketuvim, with the ones which are written from, min, sorry, from, and then he gives the opening and closing quotes. Atem re'item ki min ha'shemayim, ad sof ki yelach alamokesh, until the end of ki yelach alamokesh. What he's doing is because he didn't, he's not giving a chapter, a verse and chapter references, he's just giving quotes, and we're supposed to recognize, basically, that's the whole of the mitzvot which come after the aseret hadibrot. The, the phrase, atem um, item ki min ha'shemayim, you have seen from heaven, is the, what comes immediately after the Ten Commandments. And then, ki yelach is the end of the mishpatim. So says the Ibn Ezra, contrary to Rashi, that Moshe gave them lots and lots of detailed laws. And then he says, that kol mishpatim, meaning, asher sam lifnehem heiman is karim baparsha dozot. Those are the mitzvot which are mentioned in this parsha. So that's what Moshe said to them in Pasuk Gimel. What does he then write in, uh, sorry, in Pasuk Dalot? Vayichtav Moshe. Moshe wrote, Achash yisipeh lahem kol divrei Hashem. After he has said to them, related to them, all the words of Hashem, ha-mitzvot ha-mishpatim kadvam. He wrote them, v'zehu sefer habrit. And that's what is sefer habrit, which is then referred to in Pasuk Zion. Now, if we want to spend some time on Parshanot, it's, no, it's clear that the Ibn Ezra fits the sense of Pasuk Gimel better. When he talks about the Mishpatim, it means what we call the Mishpatim, contrary to Russia. But that's not our focus right now. Our focus right now is, what is the focus of Sefer Habla? According to the Ibn Ezra, it's a book of laws. It's a book of mitzvot. It's not a book of history. It doesn't start with Bereshit. It doesn't include the Avot. It's Jewish law. It's Halakha. And he says in particular, it's the detailed laws that they've been given up to that point, which is the whole center of Mishpatim, which are many, and which are complex, and which need erudition to understand. That's what Moshe writes down. And therefore, what are the people saying, Naseh and Nishma to? What are they saying, yeah? They're saying, yeah, we accept the mitzvot. The covenant is a covenant of laws. So we already have now two opinions. Rashi says the covenant is a covenant of history. <coughs> to be part of the Jewish people is to accept the legacy of those who have gone before. Says the Ibn Ezra, the covenant is a covenant of law. It's to accept the mitzvot. When they say Nas Eben Ishma, and this by the way is perhaps the, the, the traditional interpretation if you like, the one we usually come with, they're saying yes, we accept the mitzvot. We're happy that you've given us lots of mitzvah, you've only given us 60 or so, so far. A few, a few. You've given us quite a few so far, and there's many more to come, but we get the picture. We get the picture that they're a mitzvah, and we've got to keep them, and they're detailed, and they're complicated, etc. And that's what's written in the book, and that's what we say now, seven issues. Okay. Then there's a third opinion. And the third opinion, there's many more, but the third opinion which I want to quote, is that of the Chizkuni. And the Chizkuni says, well, I'll just read his opening words, and then I'll go back to his original source. And he says, There is, roughly translated as, there is no chronological order in the Torah. In other words, you don't have to find what we want to understand is written in Sefer Habrit, something close in the Chumash. It's like an opening to say it's actually somewhere far away. It's not what you expect. It's not near to the pair of Kaftala. It's actually very far away. So, Eimokdamu Mochaba Torah means uh, there's no chronological order in the Torah, and what's written here is actually something that was written in our Torah, in our Chumash, much later on. And before we go on, let's just remember a little bit of, having said there's no chronology, uh, chronological order in the Torah, let's just remember a little bit of chronology. The Jews arrived... Uh, the Jews left Egypt. Seven weeks later, they arrived at Har Sinai. They stayed at Har Sinai for about a year. And during the course of that year, although it's very hard to actually match up the, the sections of the Torah to precise dates, but they covered the second half of Shemot and all of Vayikra, and indeed the first Temporachim of Bamidbar. 
and that's only in chapter 11 of the Midbar that they actually get going. What did they learn during that year? What were they taught? And again, the narrative sort of breaks down because there's no chronological order going through the second half of Shema or the whole of Vayikra. But they had the laws of uh, how to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and when they built the tabernacle, and then lots of laws of sacrifices, and that's the first section of Vayikra, and then various other laws that come in Vayikra, and concludes the end of Vayikra is the Sedra of Bahar and the Sedra of Bukhukotai. And in the Sedra of Bukhukotai is what we call the Tocha the blessings and the majority of curses. If you do the right thing, things will be good. You'll get rain, you'll get peace, you'll get prosperity, you'll walk together with God. If in my statutes you walk. However, if you do the bad thing, if you don't do that, it's not going to be so good. There's going to be disease, there's going to be famine, there's going to be exile, there's going to be more famine, you're going to eat your children, etc., etc. Let's, let's not go into detail. That's there. That's there at the end of Vayikra. And that, says the Chizkuni, is what was written in Sefer HaGrit. And the Chizkuni continues at the end of the first line of paragraph 7. Heim HaTochachot. These are actually the rebukes, which is a sort of a euphemism for the curses, as we find in the Mechilta. Now, the Mechilta is a, a Midrash. Um, and let's look straight at the Mechilta now in quote number 8. So it's a Midrash from the words of Chazal, the sages of the Talmudic period, long before Rashi and Ibn Ezra. But as you'll see, it's actually the source for all the opinions we've seen this morning. Quote number 8. But you can't say for Habrit, but you can't say for Habrit. He took the Sefer Habrit and he read it in the ears of the people. Asked the question, But we haven't yet learned, we haven't heard what he read in their ears. In other words, this question which we all saw, it's a very old question. The rabbis saw it a long time before us. And here they write it explicitly. What are you talking about, Sefer Habrit? We don't know what's in the book. So let's try and answer it. So there's three, three answers given in this little source. Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Asi Omer, mitachila Bereshit va'adkan. Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Asi says it's from the beginning of Bereshit until here. And that, of course, is the source of Rashi's opinion. It's quite nice. I find it very exciting to find that these Rishonim who came up with their own ideas, they all actually come from the same source. And very often what we find in Rashi and the Rambani and Ezra actually can be traced almost explicitly or certainly implicitly to words which Chazal said a thousand years before. So the first opinion, which we call Rashi's opinion, is Metchila Bereshit Adkam. It's a book of history. Rebbe Omer, Rebbe, as Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said, Mitzvah Shinitztavu Adam HaRishon, the mitzvah which were given to Adam HaRishon, which we haven't seen before, U Mitzvah Shinitztavu B'nei Noach, and the seven mitzvah which were given to the sons of Noach, U Mitzvah Shinitztavu B'Mitzrayim, U Bamara B'Shar Kola Mitzvah Kula. And the mitzvah which were given in, in Egypt, and in Mara, where they stopped to drink the water, and, and all the rest of the mitzvah, having just gone through uh, delineating a few different sections, he then ends up by saying, and all the rest. So that's clearly the source of the Ibn Ezra opinion. <coughs> but the Sefer Habrit is a book of mitzvah. Now let's go to see the Hizkuni's opinion written out in book. Rabbi Yishmael Omer, but the Chilat Ha'inyan Mahu Omer. At the beginning of this section, not quite clear what this section is, We'll see in a moment. What does it say? And it says, Vashavta ha'aret Shabbat, the land will rest the Shabbat, Shmitim v'yobolot, brachot v'klalot. Uh, you've got the laws of Shemitah, you've got the laws of Yobel, the Jubilee year, blessings and curses. Now, in order to understand what's going on, it helps to have a homage in front of us. But what Rabbi Shmuel is saying is, I, I Rabbi Shmuel, am looking somewhere else in the Chumash. And I'm looking at the end of the Sefer Vayikra. The two sidrot often read together, they're quite short. When your son has one of them as a mitzvah sedra, he has a really short time, as my son did. And they start at that section, and he's actually missed out the most crucial bit, because he assumes that we recognize it. The beginnings of the word of the sedra of Bahar is Bahar Sinai. And Bahar, short for Bahar Sinai, opens with the words, this is what was said to Moshe at Har Sinai. 
And then it goes on to the laws of Shemitah, which is not our concern, the laws of the Jubilee, and then it goes on to the blessings and the curses. Okay? So the blessings and the curses, they're, they're in this section at the end of a Yikra, which opens with Bahar Sinai. And then he says, the Sof Ha'inyan. And at the end of the section, Mahu Amer, what does it say? Elo Ha'chukim Mishpatim Torah. These are the laws and the statutes and the judgments. And again, he's missed out the crucial bit, because again, he assumes that we know it. The conclusion of that section is, these are the laws which were given at Har Sinai. So the point is, and say it really works, you have a Chumash in front of you, the end of Vayikra is got <coughs> bookends. The beginning and the end of that section refers to Har Sinai. Says Rabbi Yishmael, when was it given at Har Sinai? During the course of what series of events? Our Parsha. It was given at the time of the Brit. And what was written in the Brit? That section. Now, okay, we have to take on trust. A Mukdam Mochaba Torah. There was no beginning and after in the Torah. There's no chronological in the Torah. It's no problem for us to say something that appears in the book of Ayikra really sort of belongs in the 24th chapter of Shabbat. That's not a problem. What might be a problem is, what's that got to do with the pies and cheese? Why are the blessings and the curses put into Sefer Habrit? And what I would like to suggest is what we have here is a profound answer to the question of what makes us Jewish. What does it mean to be part of the Jewish people? What does it mean to have a covenantal relationship with God? Answer number one. To argue with each other. <laughs> to argue with each other. <laughs> Maybe. Answer number one. Well, I'll, I'll resolve that by the end. Answer number one. It's to be the inheritors of the legacy of Jewish history. To say, your history is my history. To say, perhaps as Rabbi Lau was saying this morning, because I'm connected to a previous ancestor, to a previous generation, I continue to bear his legacy, his heritage. Answer number two, it's to share Jewish law, to share the concept of mitzvot, of halakha, of our obligations to God. Answer number three, is to share not the Jewish past, but the Jewish future, Jewish destiny. According to Rabbi Yishmael, later brought down by the Chizkuni, when they signed up and they said, Naseh the Nishma, they were saying yes to the concept of what's going to happen to them in the future. And the future is brachot v'klalot, blessings and curses. The future is that because I am part of a collective entity called the Jewish people, I will bear the fate of the Jewish people. And it won't be because of me as an individual. It will be because of the actions of us collectively. And that's what I as an individual are signing up to. When the brachot come, now I don't want to get into the whole concept of the philosophy of reward and punishment. I just went through a previous session on that, which was fascinating. But without getting into the, the question of theodicy and, 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 and how God meets out justice in the world, there is a certain level which God promises that when you do the right thing, you get rewarded, and when you do the wrong thing, you don't get rewarded. Now, we can see every day uh, examples of the country. That, that's for another time. But what the Jewish people were saying when they said, Naseh and Ishmael, is, yeah, we get it. We accept from now on in the future that when we do the right thing, we'll get rewarded, and if we do the wrong thing, there will be a consequence, and we sign up to that. We sign up to the collective Jewish future to be part of the Jewish destiny. And this really, I think, comes to full fruition in the next few words of the Midrash. Because in the last paragraph, the Midrash says like this. <coughs> well, before we get into the Midrash, remember the Chumash said, after the people said, Naseh and and Pasuk Zion, what did Moshe do? He sprinkles the blood, and he says, Hinei dama brit ashekarat Hashem imachem al ha'ela. Okay, done. You've signed, I'm signing, there's no getting out, sprinkling blood, the, the covenant is made. Now look how the Midrash replays that same verse, but with a different emphasis. So the last paragraph of, of paragraph 8. Omru, they said, the people said, Makablem anu aleinu. We accept this upon ourselves. And this is still the continuation of the third opinion, that what they are accepting is to be bound together by a collective fate. 
מקבלים אנו עלינו. כיוון שראה שקיבלו עליהם, when he saw, משה saw, but they accepted upon it themselves, נטל אדם, he took the blood, וזרק על העם, and he sprinkled it on the people. שנאמר, the verse says, ויקח משה את הדם, ויזרק על העם. משה took the blood, and he sprinkled it on the people. And now comes the words of the Midrash. אמר להם, he said to them, הרי אתם קשורים ענובים תפוסים. Now, the Hebrew speakers in this room will do better at me than splitting out the nuances between those three words. Kashurim and Nubim pretty much mean the same thing. You're tied together, you're bound together. Tafusim, you're held together. Machar, ba'u v'kiblu aleichem ha-mitzvat kulam. Tomorrow, come and accept upon yourselves the mitzvot in their entirety. What the Midrash is saying is when they said Nasev and Ishma in the context of the third interpretation, to the brachot for kalalot, Moshe then says, now you are ready to accept the Torah. Now you are ready to get the rest of the mitzvot. Why? Because you are kashurim and nuvim tafusim. You have become <coughs> one people. You, and what has made you into one entity? The collective acceptance of the collective destiny. But when Hashem says there's going to be a way the Jewish history is going to play out in the future, it's going to be blessings and curses, and we know our history has been filled of both. Sometimes we only talk about the curses, but there's been plenty of blessings as well. When the people said, yes, that's what's going to be our future, and we're in it together, Moshe then says, now I can make the covenant, and now you're ready to accept the mitzvot. Because that was the essential precondition. Who's right? <coughs> Of the three opinions we've seen, who is right? Now, of course, that's a silly question, and it's the wrong question. And by the way, when we learn Chumash, and this is a little bit of pedagogy here, when we learn Chumash, in my opinion, it is both very productive and very correct to teach different interpretations within the framework of our traditional set of interpretations, and not to ask the question, who is right? Because you can't answer that. The only answer you can possibly give is they're all right. If they are within the box of traditional Judaism, they're all right. <coughs> but the question is, what do they add to each other, and what do we take away from it? And we take away the totality of what we've learned from the three different opinions, which are put together in the Midrash. <coughs> what does it mean that we made a covenant with God? And hence, what does it mean that we are part of an ongoing covenantal relationship with God? Answer number one. It means that we accept Jewish history. That's why we teach Jewish history, because it makes us who we are in a way that is different from any other history. We learn about the French Revolution because it's interesting. We learn about Jewish history because it's who we are. And it's who we are because it's part of what's written in Sefer Abrit. <coughs> of course, Sefer Habrit includes mitzvot. <coughs> of course, the part of that covenant, an integral part of that covenant, is there's a set of rules that God wants us to live by. And we try our best to live by them, and that's our covenant we have with God. But the third part is the covenant effective that we have with God and each other at the same time. The covenant that makes us into one people, the covenant which is the acceptance and the guarantor, and if you like, the initiation and the creation of the collective Jewish destiny. So if the question is, yes, we're a covenantal people, yes, we have a covenant with God, and we are formed into one entity, what does that mean? It means that, and probably much more. But as a starting point, it means history, it means law, and it means destiny. Thank you very much.